Okay, looking good. Looking good. <clears throat> Okay. We'll be back momentarily.
Good afternoon. I see that I have we have eight students online, so which is a little lower number than usually. But as it is uh, twelve fifteen, it's already twelve sixteen actually. So I guess this, this is pretty much time to get started. Um, so here's our agenda for today's lecture. So. Uh, we're gonna get started by wrapping up, wrapping up the technical matter about uh, large deformation. Now that will be the last technical detail to discuss. Uh, I'm estimating that will take um, 25 minutes to half an hour, roughly that much. Uh, maybe a bit longer than that. But anyway, so it's not gonna take a, you know the entire lecture, but good amount of that, or good percentage of that. And then what follows is a recap. And the recap is a um, summary about the information that I'm expecting you to know when you're getting to um, uh, next midterm exam. And uh, also the questions that you can expect to find in written exam will be, will be available for you in that part of the lecture. Then uh, something that I, Honestly, I don't think that I'm able to do it today is a uh, master thesis and career counseling. Those two things are like two separate things. So I would like to spend some time to explaining about my views about what makes you to be a successful candidate to complete the master thesis. And then there's a bit longer perspective is a career counseling. Like, you know, what kind of things make sense to do a little bit of something that I recommend you not to do. Uh, so those are two two separate stories. But I, when I was putting together all the slides for today's lecture, I realized that there is a, let me see, a total of, hold on, hold on. So 65 slides. Usually I'm able to cover some 30 to 40 slides per lecture. So, uh, Obviously, it's going to be a little too much for a single lecture. So probably really don't know, but my prediction is that uh, I need to leave this master thesis career counseling for next week, Wednesday. I thought it was really my my desire. I'm sure it's your desire too to have this as a last lecture. And it will be the last lecture because this master thesis career counseling is going to be something that uh, is not going to be part of the course material itself, but it's something like supplementary material, uh, something that um, maybe would be um, useful for you. But if you are busy and if you have something better to do, simply skip it, simply skip it. I can see that there's... Uh, you know, my camera settings are not so perfect today. So for some reason, there's a quite a bit of shadow here. So let me, just a second, I, I will do a final tuning here. I think it may be this one. How is now? Is it any better? Oh yeah, much better, much better. Okay, now I'm happy. So that's what follows. And uh, let me see, I need to put my... Uh, that window to be visible so I can see your comments. So no comments so far. Anyways, we will get started from the large deformation. And then what follows is this um, summary. Large deformation um, is something that is more designed for a doctoral level student rather than a master level student. But this is not, I'm not going to step into details, but I'm going to provide just an overview about the subject matter of large deformation in multi-body applications. And why is that I would like to do it? Well, that's simply because if you look at the publication made out of the, my team or the team of machine design, many of them are in a field of flexible multi-body dynamics, how to describe the mechanical deformation in multi-body framework. And in those papers, there's a huge body of papers that are related to how to describe large deformation or how to apply the methods that are designed to describe large deformation in practical applications. So that's why. And again, that's simply because I, well, a few years back, uh, student union uh, emailed all the professors asking them to teach more about research topics that are currently active. 
So here it is. Here's a topic that is currently active in LUT University. Of course, in other teams, they may have a little bit of different flavors and different things that they are emphasizing, but we do have a lot of things that are related to large deformation. And I can see that again, the shadow is coming back. So is it because uh, maybe I should sit a bit more like, I don't know. I think that it, it will do the job. Okay, large deformation. So let's get started from the background. So a little bit about something that is good to know in the very beginning. And then um, something that is a borderline case. I mean, it, in, in terms of level of difficulty. So I want to explain a little bit about the element technology that is used to describe large deformations. And um, you, might have, you might find those explanations to be a little bit confusing because they are, first of all, finite element based method. But they have certain particular features and or special features that makes them suitable for description of large deformation. And um, when you hear them first time, it may be um, a bit too challenging to learn it in a, you know within a few minutes or you know within a one lecture. But I still could introduce a little bit about the element technology because those gives you another you know kind of piece of information. What kind of things we're doing and what are the developments made in LUT University? And then more like practical oriented part of the lecture is the applications. So what kind of application being studied by using the technology element formulations that are developed in in LUT University and other universities as well. So, so that's the content for the first part of the lecture. So, uh, why, why to describe flexibility? Well, you know that the, you know it makes sense to describe flexibility because it improves model accuracy. So it makes model to be closer to reality. Sometimes the the mechanical deformation is so significant that if you are ignoring the, the mechanical deformation, the accuracy of the model is not acceptable. Examples are crane-like structures. You know, often the deformation is so significant that they really affect the performance, dynamic, dynamic performance of the machine. And they will introduce additional vibration and the additional difficulties that need to be accounted to make a good design. So that's the first reason. Then, sometimes the deformation is large. And remember what a difference between the small and large deformation, that's pretty much like what is relationship between the displacement and strain. And again, remember this, this story that we look at this cantilever beam and we loaded the cantilever beam. This is a force. And due to the force, there is a deformation, which is amount of U here. Now it's all about how is the relation between the U and strain, displacement strain. If this relation is assumed to be linear, which is okay, then the deformation need to be considered as a small deformation. It means that when you when you look at the free end of the cantilever beam, it reminds on this loading line. And in reality, it only reminds in a loading line when the deformation is small, when it becomes to be a lot bigger than you know, it's hard to say like what not numerical any numerical values, but when it becomes to be larger, you know, then the deformation is more like this. And this one here, this axial displacement can be only accounted when you have this nonlinear strain displacement relationship. Okay, when this is becoming to be handy. Well, of course, in a case when you are really dealing with the structures that are experiencing large deformation. Cables, belts, biomechanical applications are good examples. Here's a belt structure that is using in a engine of some kind. And you can see that, you know, the you know, if you look at the piece of belt here, you know, the belt, you know, first of all is having or experiencing the large translation and large rotation because it's going around in this structure like this. Oh, here, like this. And then every now and then is is attached in the, the pulley. And because it attached in the pulley, it is also experiencing a large deformation. So this is a good example where you actually have to deal with the large deformation to make a model of this kind of belt component. 
Virops are having the same kind of feature. Um, Clothes, like if you wanted to analyze how is the fabric behavior, which is sometimes analyzed, a often used thing in a game technology. And you know, there is a one uh, team that um, we don't cooperate anymore anymore, but we used to have a good connection. Uh, this other team was uh, is well, still is located in South Korea, and they wanted to analyze the the washing machine, how the washing machine is behaving or performing. And of course, the washing machine only makes sense to analyze that if there is a clothes inside. So they model the clothes, like fabrics, put it inside of the model of the washing machine, and they they was able to see like how they are, I don't know, going around. And that's another example about the, where the large deformation is needed. So those those are kind of like the special cases. So not necessarily needed in every, I mean regular life but every now and then there is a there is a case that you need to analyze it and that's we're going to learn today like how we can make it happen well first of all there is a uh, many different ways many different formulas on how you can describe the large deformation but today we have to make a choice that we can only look at one of them not many of them but Good to keep in mind that there is really a many of different possibilities how the large deformation can be described. But today we're going to look at the something that in LUT University we are active, and that's um, absolute non corner formulation. And this is a formulation that is being under development more than a 20 years now, way more than a 20 years now, and it, it's already somewhat established in a sense that some of the neuro commercial softwares are or made it implemented in the formulation that they code and certain aspects still need some more developments and it's quite amazing like 20 years and still not yet ready yes that's that's the case at the moment so it still needs some further developments but it's a formulation that can be applied to use like structural elements and structural elements like our beams plate cells cables, this kind of things. So it's not really very much suitable for solid type of elements, but more like elements that are describing the certain feature of the structure, like beam-like structure, it's described by beam element. Cell-like structure or plate-like structure can be described by using a plate element. So it fits well to this kind of elements, plates, beams, this kind of things. And uh, it's... Um, method that is based on uh, slopes. What, the, what are these slopes? I'm going to tell you that to you momentarily. And it's having the very special feature. And the special feature is that the kinematics is extremely simple. And the kinematics is simply this. So what is that I have here? Well, I have here set function matrix and the vector of nodal coordinates. And uh, that's about it. That's only that you need. And now this equation, this symbol equation is made sets the way, basically this component, vector of nodal coordinates, and this component, which is a uh, safe function matrix, are built such the way that it can describe large translations, large rotations. So it's not exactly the same than conventional finite element method, or actually it's not at all the same than the conventional finite element method, because it's capable to, to describe these large reference motion. So so that's the method that we're going to look at today. And uh, how much we're going to look at that today? We're going to still, you know, keep it in a, we're kind of scratching the surface. So we are not stepping too much into the details. All right. So what makes this method to be possible to use this very Symbol equation to describe everything, you know, deformation, large, large translation, large rotation. Well, it's a trick that is called. Oh, I see. I see that my my slides are a little bit off. So just a second, I will make a minor tuning here. This one. I need to make it a bit smaller. So hold on, hold on. Here and then back like this. All right, so it will do the job. 
Okay. So why did it, you know, what makes it possible to use the symbol equation? Well, it's possible by using a technique that is called uh, vectorization technique. And let me explain that to you. So it's a, maybe a little bit of confusing, but you know, in conventional finite element approach, when we are looking at the, uh, not a decrease of freedom, like that's what we, this is a PML that we studied uh, five weeks ago, more than that, more than the five weeks ago. But we look at this is done in the very beginning of the course. And we notice that this is a beam element that consists of two nodal degrees of freedom at uh, each nodal location. And these degrees of freedom are displacement in a transverse direction, this one here, and then the slope. And the slope is something that you can easily get by differentiating this displacement, y displacement, with respect to this longitudinal coordinate. So this tells here, maybe it's a little small, but it says parcel y, two, which is this particular location, parcel x, and x is this direction here. So that's what you use in conventional finite element method. So what we're going to do here is that instead of using this scalar quantity that is describing the displacement in a transverse direction, we're going to describe this nodal location by using a vector. So that's where the name vectorization is coming from, all right? So we can uh, describe this point here as a vector. So now this vector here in a planar case consists of two components, which obviously are displacement in a global X and global Y direction, all right? Now this is a vector like mentioned already a million times. So what we're gonna do in addition to that is that we're gonna take a the same slope than here, but this time with respect to vector. So it's going to give us another vector, which is called slope vector. And it's going to be like shown here, parcel R1, no, R2, excuse me, parcel X. So there is a clear relation between the absolute nodal corner formulation and conventional finite element method. Here we are dealing, I mean, here we are dealing with the vectors all the time with the vectors. Here we deal with the scalar quantities. Right, now using this symbol trick, if you may, I'm capable to describe safe function matrix. And the safe function matrix actually is consist of exactly the same component that in the case of conventional beam element. I'm just multiplying each one of the component by identity matrices, which is two by two identity matrix. So I'm kind of scaling it up if you may. And then my nodal degrees of freedom are vectors and they slopes. And these slopes are the ones that are capable to describe orientation of um, that particular nodal location. So that's the trick behind. And now you're ready to go. So this is your kinematics. And the kinematics is capable to describe large translation, large rotation without using any kind of transformation matrices. So it's Simple like that. So it's good to go without any kind of transformation matrices or updating procedures. And that's what makes it this powerful method because it's so simple. Right. So uh, that's how it goes. Now in um, conventional finite term method, usually these rotational degrees of freedom are not described by using this parcel operation. You know, remember there was the slope in the one end of the beam was parcel y to parcel x. Now, this is a procedure that is typically not used. And reason being that if uh, using this description, then you are unable to describe transverse shear deformation. And transverse shear deformation is something that is uh, important if you are considering a structure that is fairly thick, uh, the thickness is fairly high versus its length. It simply means, well, I'm cutting the corners a little bit, but it simply means that, you know, if, it, if you know, using this technique, we are assuming that um, cross-section is always perpendicular with respect to the bit line. In real life, that's not necessarily the case. And uh, that's simply because of the shear deformation, transverse 
shear deformation. And because of the transverse shear deformation, the cross section may have this kind of orientation, which is no longer perpendicular. So this is not, I don't know how to describe it, not perpendicular with respect to midline. Okay. Now, how this is then described in the conventional finite element method? Well, it's described in a way that we are not using this one here, but instead we are using just a rotational parameter theta. And the rotational parameters are interpolated by using you know, similar technique than displacement. So that's the way to go. In the absolute Noirac corner formulation, is a completely another story. In the absolute Noirac corner formulation, solution, or the way to, to describe the transverse set deformation is by adding more slopes. Okay, so if initially we have the slope here, which is, I'm going to write the slopes to be a bit bigger here. So it's what it was a parcel R2 parcel X. Now what we can do is that we can have another parcel differentiation operation. And another one could be parcel X2 parcel Y. Now that's it. So what it means is that if I have this one slope in axial direction, another slope in a transverse direction. And now because these two slopes are independent, they can be used to describe transverse set deformation. Now the transverse set deformation is, um, um, like I said, it's only important when you're dealing with the thick structures. And when you're dealing with the really slender structures, not so significant. And in a multi-body system dynamics, really when you find a large deformation, typically is the case when you are dealing with the slender structures. But anyway, so this is how the absolute Noracone formulation works. And this same concept, the slopes, different directions can be applied to plate elements. And remember this story about um, um, safe function matrix that was a 48 times 48 in dimensions. These are the numbers that I'm never going to forget in my life because I was struggling with this big time. And I said that it was a pure pain to find the safe function matrix. And the polynomial basis for that was extremely hard to find. And I tried like, I don't know, a million different combinations. And then finally I was able to find it. And this was the story like, I don't remember what was that, you know, what is that we learned from the story, except that there was a lot of work to do it. This anyways was the polynomial basis that I eventually was able to create it. And it was the one that was a winning combination and it was capable to produce safe function matrix for displayed elements, which consists of 48 degrees of freedom. Four node, 48 degrees of freedom. So it means that each one of the nodal location here consists of 12 degrees of freedom, 12. And that's like 12. Okay, so uh, isn't that a little bit too much? Because, you know, if you are thinking about what are the displacement, it could be translations, that's three, rotations, another three, what are the rest? There is still six left. So what is this additional six are representing? Well, you know, I will explain that to you in a second. But anyway, so uh, if shortly visiting back to the previous slide, you know, here, when using this absolute not corner formulation, it's very important to understand that now the, the element is no longer parametricized by using a line, but this is more a solid parametricization or area parametricization if you're looking at the planar elements. So the, the nature changes completely. And in a plane, excuse me, the plate, so this too is... Uh, solid type of parametricization, but still the element is designed for structural applications, plate-like structures and this kind of things. But anyway, so what about these additional degrees of freedom? What is it they standing for? Well, they standing for a cross-section deformation or a fiber deformation in case of plate. In a plate, you know, the fiber that stands out from the, the mid surface, that can change its length and it can change its orientation. 
And that's something that is captured by these additional six degrees of freedom. In a plate, excuse me, in a beam element, so we can describe the cross-section deformation of the beam structure which most of the cases is not that significant, but this is a feature that in certain application is really helpful, really helpful. Let's put it this way. Okay, so that's what it means. So shortly, you know, the absolute non corner formulation to method to describe large deformation, it has its basis on final German method, but we're using a procedure called vectorization and in the vectorization, the nodal location is no longer, or nodal displacement is no longer described by a scalar component, but the vector. And when we are, when I'm differentiating the vectors with respect to my global or local coordinates, I can get the slopes. And these slopes can describe orientation and cross-section deformation. That's in short. All right, then comes something interesting. This is a little bit like, something that it's more career counseling than real scientific information. Okay, so how is that, uh, you, once you have a kinematic radius, how is that you can describe elastic forces? Because you know, in a, you have to have this elastic forces because that's something that describes the flexibility. Well, I'm not gonna get in too much in the details, but it can be described by using a method called a continuum mechanics. I'm sure that many of you have heard it. Many of you are master of the method and you know the details of the method. But it's simply um, based on the, this kind of parcel operation. This time when you use it in a way that is described here. And uh, this is, ex you know, very straightforward. Exactly what you have in absolute not corner formulation. And it makes it easy to describe elastic forces, a vector of elastic forces. So it's, it's straightforward. Let me put it this way. Okay. So that wall was developed more than uh, 20 years back. So I think at the, you know, if I, if I look like when this paper was dated, so it was published 2001, that's exactly 20 years ago. And this paper, this was an important paper in the sense that it described the whole idea about the absolute rock on the formulas. This one here was published 2003. So it was an extension to play. Now look at the author here. Oh, yeah, that's me, together with Ahmed Chabana, and he's a big name, he's a big guy. All right, but anyways, then what was, uh, so this was already 20 years ago, and it, we thought that, okay, this is end of the story. So it's ready, method is ready, to be applied to any kind of um, application you want, because it was very simple, very easy to implement, and seems that it's very efficient and extremely accurate because it captures every single thing, including the cross-section deformation. And then something surprising happened. And something surprising that happened was that, uh, well, at the time that, um, you know, this paper was made, this one here, this one here, I was uh, in my postdoc phase of my career. So I already got my doctor degree and I work as a postdoc in University of Illinois at Chicago, so UIC. And uh, I got, you know, good relation to LUT University, of course. And there was one guy that wanted to make a visit to UIC, the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, just for three months, all right? So the, the student came, he was a doctoral student at the time, and uh, he got the symbol assignment to verify that, you know, everything is correct by using a symbol cases, like cantilever structures or something, something simple like that. And uh, then there was a meeting after his arrival and he started to work with this and there was a, a follow-up meeting, let me, well, I think like after a couple of weeks. And the person came to meeting and say, I cannot do it. And everyone was like, you cannot what? You know, you have such a simple assignment, so why don't you just make it happen? So it's simple like that. And the person was insisting, you know, I cannot make it happen. I, I don't, I, you know, the, the numbers do not match. You know, you know, numbers are not matching, so uh, I cannot do this simple verification. 
Oh, well, of course, what happened was that the, the person got the extra two weeks to finalize this simplest possible assignment. And I was already in the same because, you know, this, this guy was uh, from LUT University. So I had my home university, LUT University, and he's unable to do the simplest possible assignment. Well, after two weeks in a follow-up meeting, the same story again. I cannot do it. I don't make the numbers match. And it was like most embarrassing ever. And what happened is three months, you know, was completed. And the final conclusion, I'm unable to do it. I cannot do it. Okay, so uh, student went back to Finland. And after I think a year or something, I finally finalized my postdoc period and I arrived. And I got to this position, this current position in LUT University. And I met this guy and he said, now I know the problem. I know why I was able to make the numbers too much because the formulation has a serious problem. The formulation is not correct. And it wasn't correct. He was right about this all the time. And this name, this guy that figured that out, you may know it. He's used his open. Used his open and figured it out that, okay, this formulation is incorrect. I mean that there was a serious problem in the formulation, which later we were able to fix it. But this is a good example about, about the career counseling. And even, even though that, you know, um, your supervisors, your professors are pushing you to a certain direction, you still have to be honest and you still have to trust the numbers and not to make numbers to, you know, don't bend the, the, the truth because it will come out anyways. So we'll have a follow-up story in this, this thing, but I will save that for next week. Wednesday. All right. So what happened was that, you know, in a simple cantilever example, you know, you can you can select the parameters in a way that you can get very much incorrect solution. Something that the element is suffering from the meth from the mechanism that is called locking. This is what you can often find in a finite element method. So it's common in a finite element method. Typical way to fix the, the, the locking is that uh, it's like First of all, the reason for locking is an incorrect kinematics. That's, you know, generally speaking. Of course, there's another details related to that. But that's the inherent source for locking. The typical problem to fix it is to compute things incorrectly. So you have first mistake and you do intentionally another mistake. And what happens is this other mistake is compensating your first mistake. And the final solution is very good. It's very good. It works. Um, now this locking was this method was suffering from locking big time, like serious locking mechanisms, and then later what was you know at least several years was devoted to to fix these these locking problems, and then finally the family of different elements were ready, and there's a higher lower order elements, and. Uh, many different applications. Lower order elements, so, you know, there's a guy that you probably know that was active in the field. He is this guy here, Kimmo Kerkan. Some of you may have, you have perhaps met him. He is uh, currently a teacher in LUT University. And then um, high order elements, there is a Dr. Marko Matikainen, who is currently academy fellow. He's very much specialized to this high order elements. So what is that this standing for? They are standing for like how many, you know, you, you know, if you have these parcel operations, you know, are you increasing or decreasing the parcel operation? Because you can go higher order like this, or even higher than that. And you can have more and more complicated deformations, cross-section deformations that you can capture. Or you can lower them. You can reduce them. Those are the two alternative choices. And they have, you know, certain applications needs higher order elements, certain applications needs lower order elements. So they all have certain plays in this planet. Okay, so finally, we were able to do some practical examples. Now here is a, like flying spaghetti. It still is, you know, not necessary anything that you needed in the real life. But the flying spaghetti is, uh, is an academic benchmark problem. A benchmark problem means that this is uh, computed by using number of different methods. And it's very complicated, extremely difficult to compute it. And if you're able to do it in your new formulation, you can congratulate yourself. So you can 
say that, okay, you know, it looks good, so I can get, you know, things correctly. And then you can start looking at how is a computational efficiency. You know, it works such the way that you have a beam line structure that is very soft, like a spaghetti. And then you are, you know, introducing these forces and moments to make it move, and it's going to fly. So that's where the flying spaghetti is coming from. Then a little bit more practical things, though these are the belt-like structures in a planner case in different uh, applications. This is a Xerox machine. Hold on, where is my pointer now? This is a Xerox machine, like this. Another case of lots of uh, lots of deformation. And then wire ropes, cables, wire ropes. This is where it is often used. And then there is a very special technique that is applied, whatever you're dealing with that wire ropes. And in this special technique, there is a, this this one here, which stands for arbitrary Lacranzian Eulerian, you know, this part, arbitrary Lacranzian Eulerian. And it's a method that you can change the element length without introducing any strains. And this is extremely handy in a, in hosting devices, elevators, because in elevators, you know, the wires are maybe very long and some, you know, they can get shorter. Now, if you need to model that by using a large number of elements, your computational efficiency will be very low. So, so that can be avoided by using a technique where the element length is changed. And that's arbitrary Lacranzian Eulerian approach. And I said that it's going to be half an hour. I already spent on half an hour, so we'll speed up a bit. What happened to this slide? Here are the other applications like um, uh, this catenary systems that are using in trains, leaf springs that is applied to there to uh, other vehicles. It's been applied to tire models as well because the tires, those two can experience a large deformation. Then some biomechanical applications, very heavily used at the moment. Soft tissues, extremely hard to model by using any other technique than this. Then uh, a little bit about um, nano electromechanical systems, you know, fluid dynamics combined, then optimization, this kind of things being used. All right. Then fairly recently, there is uh, something interesting that was discovered. Well, it was actually discovered that this absolute non accordant formula has a close relation to um, isogeometric method. And isogeometric method is something that is, it sounds like it's going to be promising because um, one of the key problems in uh, conventional finite element approaches is the fact that, you know, the meshing, creating the mesh, you know, creating the element mesh how the structure is discretized by different size of elements. This is the one that typically takes most of the time. And that's simply because in engineering applications, you get started from the CAT drawing. And the CAT drawing, you're kind of converting your drawings to be in a form that you can place elements top of the, the, the this kind of geometry. But it's not simple because Finite elements are using polynomials, whereas in um, CAT software, they are not using, I mean, that they're using NURBS, which are non-uniform rational piece lines. That's what this is standing for. And this meets matching, that's what's causing a quite a bit of headache. And you can see this meets matching or the headache because of that, simply when you do the meshing. And typically you need to do the mesh, and then you realize, okay, there's a details, part of the structure which, you know, kind of destroying your mess, is making too many elements for the certain detail that you really don't care. And then you need to redo your mess. And then then you do the messing again, then you realize that there's another detail that is again, is not, you know, get along well with your mess. And you need to keep on going back and forth. And this is what takes quite a bit of time. Now then, Relation between absolute non corner formulation and NURBS, you know, makes them in a same kind of family than other isogeometric formulation. And in isogeometric formulations, elements are no longer based on polynomials, but the rational non these NURBS, non-uniform rational piece lines. 
So that's the idea. So idea of, okay, let me, let me make this clear here. So in isogeometric analysis, elements are based on NURBS. And NURBS, in turn, are the ones that are used in CAD software. So you can make this meshing to be more straightforward. All right. Conclusion. Conclusion is this. So uh, in absolute not a corner formalizer, we're using this vectorization procedure. And transverse cell deformation is accounted by using this more slopes, simply like that. And it can be applied to vehicles, biomechanical applications, rotating structures, optimization, of course, multi-physical analysis, cable dynamics. Question which is very hard because I did not emphasize this much. Let me see, I have 21 students. So I'm asking, in the isogeometric analysis, finite elements are based on nerves, polynomials, trigonometric functions, or imaginary functions. What is correct one? Game is on, Socrative is on, he is active at the moment. So let me see how it is. And I was, you know, nowhere near half an hour. 45 minutes I spent for this. My apology. 45 minutes. I don't know what the heck is with me. So it seems that I, you know, keep on explaining things, you know, too slowly. Don't get this thing. I don't understand. Easier and getting slower and slower. Okay, so where is my shortcut even now? Here it is. Okay, I got seven answers already. And I see I only have 20 students following this lecture today. All right. By the way, while you are entering your answers to Socrative, practical thing that is extremely important to discuss. Um, I emailed you, or I, I used Moodle earlier today, and uh, I, you got the message from me. And in the message, there is a link that takes you to voting action side, or the side that gives you the possibility to tell me what day and time is most suitable for you to have the next midterm exam. So, and uh, I'm hopefully, I hope that you can make your voting action by Friday. And as soon as, um, you know, sometimes Friday afternoon, I will close the voting and I will announce you when the next midterm exam will be. There's going to be another message, some kind via model. And in that message, I will tell you when the exam will take a place. There will be another voting action in which you can select one question that will be in exam paper for 100% certainty and uh, one question that will not be in the exam paper for 100% certainty. Uh, those, will be, those will be the things to do. So, so um, very important practical matters. So please do the voting for midterm exam. So let me know what time fits for you. And as soon as you have your made your votings, and it's going to be on Friday, I will tell you when the next midterm exam will take a place. When? It will be in a model again, so it's not going to be any kind of like conventional paper exam, but similar kind of exam than the previous exam. And then the one more thing is this, this question policy. So I'm going to allow you to select one question for the exam paper and one question that will not be in exam paper. Okay. And game is on, so we I see that we have an answers already. So, um, so momentarily I will release the correct um, answer. This is not easy today. So I'm because it's not easy, and because I did not really emphasize this. My guess is this. Look at that, 65, 65, fairly long. All right. And this is, by the way, is this is it. So this was the last technical thing. So the next is just a summary. And then, uh, like, I guess we don't have a time today to discuss about 
uh, master thesis. Maybe we can get started from the master thesis business, but career counselor, we cannot. Okay, when you upload the questions, the questions are in my PowerPoint presentation, so you will see them momentarily. So the next one right after this is going to be where I am now, this one, recap. And in recap, you can see all the questions.